and welcome to today's presentation, IBD in the Workplace, Employee and Employer Resources. My name is Emily Brown and I'm the Patient Education Content and Project Manager at Patient Advocate Foundation. Patient Advocate Foundation is a national nonprofit organization helping patients manage barriers surrounding their chronic and critical illness. I have worked at PAF for over seven years and five of those years I worked as a case manager helping patients one-on-one -on -one to navigate challenges to their care and well-being, including workplace issues. Patient Advocate Foundation is so pleased to be partnering with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation for today's presentation on this important topic. Our goal for today's webinar is to help patients with inflammatory bowel disease understand their rights in the workplace. We will go over laws and strategies, including the Family and Medical Leave Act, long- and short-term disability insurance, the Americans with Disabilities Act and workplace accommodations, and returning to work in COVID-19. In May 2019, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation published the results of a study looking at the cost of inflammatory bowel disease in over 52,000 patients. The cost of care for an IBD patient were looked at and compared to the cost of health care for a patient without IBD. They looked at the cost paid by the health plan, the patient, including deductibles, co-pays, and co-insurance, and the combined total cost. What they found was that care costs for IBD patients are three times higher than those patients that did not have IBD, and IBD patients pay twice as much out-of-pocket than those without it. This cost has climbed over the past five years, partly due to increasing medication costs. As well, unfortunately, IBD patients are estimated to have three times more work-related lost wages than non-IBD patients. To maintain these costs for care, most patients will need to work. However, having inflammatory bowel disease and a job can be challenging at times. Some patients find they struggle to manage IBD in their job. Keep in mind there are insurance options as well as a few federal and state laws that protect people with IBD and require employers to implement accommodations to help one manage work and IBD. The first law we will touch on today is the Family and Medical Leave Act. The Family and Medical Leave Act often referred to as FMLA, is a federal law which allows workers with a serious health condition to take up to 12 weeks of leave from work without the threat of losing their job. A common misconception about FMLA is that it will provide income to make up for lost wages while an employee is out. However, that is not the case. FMLA is an unpaid benefit. Not everyone is eligible for FMLA protections, there are regulations regarding who can access this benefit based on several different factors. For an employee to meet requirements for FMLA, employees must have worked under the covered employer for at least 12 months and those months do not have to be consecutive. The employee must have worked at least 1,250 hours to the employer during the 12-month period immediately before the leave. For an employer to be covered to provide FMLA benefits, they must be a private sector employer with 50 or more employees, a public agency, including any state, local, or federal agencies, regardless of the number of employees, or a public or private elementary or secondary school, regardless of the number of employees. Under this law, immediate family members acting as primary caregivers can also take 12 weeks of leave from their workplace. Someone might need to access FMLA benefits for IBD if they need to take time off for surgery, a hospital stay, doctor's visits or outpatient care, or for mental health. You do not need to disclose your diagnosis to your employer, but you do need to provide information that your leave is necessary due to an FMLA protected condition. For example, you can say you have been to the doctor and have been given medication and told to stay home for a week. While out on FMLA leave, you will still be covered under your health insurance benefits. But if you're not receiving a paycheck while you're out on FMLA, you may have to pay your portion of the premium of your health coverage. I wanted to share some tips to help you communicate with your employer if you need to utilize FMLA leave. The first is to notify your employer as soon as you know that you need FMLA. Give your employer at least 30 days advance notice if you can. 
If you learn of your need to leave less than 30 days in advance, you must give your employer notice as soon as you can, generally either the day you learn of the need for leave or the next workday. The second tip is to allow time for your doctor's office to complete the paperwork necessary. This can take time as doctor's offices are very busy, so be sure to plan ahead to give them time to complete the paperwork. The third tip is to provide medical certification within 15 days. There's no requirement for an employer to request medical certification if an employer has enough information to know that an employee's absence is qualifying for FMLA. However, employers typically respond to FMLA leave requests by providing the employee with the notice of eligibility and rights and responsibilities and a medical certification form. The fourth is to contact your employer if anything changes or if you need more time or less time. It's just important to stay in touch with your employer and to keep them up to speed on your condition. Once you've notified your employer of your need for leave, you can expect to be informed of your eligibility within five business days of your request. If your employer approves your leave, they must provide a written rights and responsibilities notice within five days, which informs the employee of the specific expectations and obligations associated with the FMLA leave request and the consequences if those obligations are not met. If the employer determines the employee is not eligible for leave, it must state at least one reason why the employee is uneligible. Provide the eligibility notice to the employee within five business days of the initial request for leave or of learning that an employee's leave may be for an FMLA qualifying reason. If you're denied, your company may offer you the opportunity to appeal or clarify your request. If not, you can consult with an attorney or file a complaint with the Department of Labor, which may take legal action against your employer. If your employer requests a medical certification, you have 15 calendar days to provide that certification, and we'll go into that now. If your employer asks for a medical certification, you must respond within 15 calendar days and provide the following information. The contact information for your healthcare provider, when you were diagnosed with IBD, how long you expect to be out of work due to your condition, any appropriate medical facts about your IBD, including information on symptoms, hospitalizations, doctor visits, etc., or whether you need to request leave continuously or occasionally. As well, your employer can request a second opinion to validate your condition, but they must cover the cost of that appointment. As well, your employer may request a third opinion if the first and second opinions differ. But again, your employer must cover any costs associated with those appointments. If you initially request to be off for six weeks and then you aren't recovering, you can request more FMLA up to 12 weeks. Your employer has the right to request another certification be provided to verify the need for additional time. When you return to work, you must be returned to the same position or one equal in pay, benefits, responsibilities, and work conditions. If your employer has multiple work sites, you're not guaranteed to return to the one you were working at prior to your leave. However, the employer must ensure that the new work site is still a reasonable distance from your home. If your leave extended past the 12 allowed weeks, your employer does not have to keep your job open. When you are able to go back to work, your employer may want a statement from your healthcare provider just certifying your ability to return to work. We quickly wanted to highlight an IBD patient who has personal experience with FMLA. This is Jen. Jen was diagnosed at age 10 with Crohn's disease and at age 27 needed a permanent ileostomy. She was working full-time and requested FMLA for her employer to have surgery and recover. Unfortunately, she experienced complications after her surgery and ended up at home for six months. During this time, she utilized short and long-term disability benefits through her employer. She was open about her condition with her employer, and they worked to make a plan together so Jen could return to work on an abbreviated schedule until she was fully recovered and could return full-time. The next topic we're going to discuss is disability insurance benefits. There are two main types of disability benefits typically offered by your employer. The first is short-term disability, which is a type of insurance benefit that provides some compensation or income replacement for non-job-related injuries or illness 
that render you unable to work. Long-term disability insurance is an insurance policy that provides income replacement for workers if they become unable to work due to an illness or injury, and they can continue paying bills and meeting financial goals and obligations. As I mentioned, most people do get access to disability insurance benefits through benefits package at their employer. Short-term disability runs concurrently with FMLA, but it is not protected job leave. Most people encounter short-term disability insurance, often referred to as STDI, for the first time when they're signing up for employee benefits. It's designed to offer financial support to replace lost income when you're unable to work due to your diagnosis or if you are recuperating from a surgery or an injury. Short-term disability plans have different eligibility limitations and payouts associated with them, and they're administered by a number of different commercial insurance companies. Generally, you're going to get approximately 60 to 70% of your gross income, and some plans allow the ability for you to purchase higher benefit amounts for a higher monthly premium. As well, some states require employers to actually carry this insurance for their employees. An employee can file a claim to collect it as well, so check with your state or your employer to see if you're eligible for those benefits. As well, some states actually do offer their own disability benefits, and if you live in a state where that's offered, that might be something you can tap into as well. You will run into a waiting period, and you won't be able to access benefits until you've been out of work, generally for a week or two. During that time, you can utilize any sick time or vacation that you have saved up in that waiting period. And generally, you will be able to access these benefits three to six months at a time. Long-term disability can be used following short-term disability or alone. Long-term disability provides income for an extended period of time, much past what short-term disability offers. It's paid for by an individual or, as we mentioned, offered as part of your employer's benefits package. Normally, you must be disabled for 90 to 180 days before it will pay. This gives an opportunity for short-term disability to cover you prior to long-term disability picking up. Short-term disability policy benefits must be exhausted before applying for long-term disability. Long-term disability plans generally define disability in one of two ways. It can mean the inability to perform the tasks of your own occupation or the tasks of any occupation at all. In your policy, it will outline how your long-term disability benefits operate with the federal Social Security Disability Program and whether or not you need to apply for Social Security Disability. It is challenging for IBD patients to qualify for long-term disability. You must be able to prove that you're disabled as defined by your insurance policy. To do so, you will need to provide proof of your condition and how your condition limits your ability to work. Although it's difficult to get approved, there is an established appeals process that would require writing a letter and getting physician support along with providing medical records to prove your inability to work. We have another story to share, and unlike Jen's story we heard before, Stephanie's employer was not as accommodating. They had very little awareness and understanding of IBD in the workplace. Stephanie has had Crohn's for 28 years and worked as a microbiologist in a lab. The work environment was challenging to someone with IBD as Stephanie did not have a restroom convenient to her, and on some days she could not get out of bed due to her debilitating disease. Due to the severity of her condition, Stephanie did go on short and then long-term disability. Her employer unfortunately pressured her to return to work before her doctor recommended and also forced her to check in on a weekly basis about her health status. Eventually, that lab did let Stephanie go while she was out on disability. She did take a new position, but unfortunately was still having a difficult time managing her condition and again went on short and long-term disability at this new position. She since applied for SSI through the help of her attorney. Another federal law we will go over is the Americans with Disabilities Act. 
The ADA, as it's often referred to, is a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities. IBD is a health condition which affects every patient differently, and for some patients, their IBD may be considered disabling. The ADA bans employment discrimination on the basis of workers' disability. If an individual has a disability, it is not a requirement that that disability is disclosed up front or before employment. The employee may inform their employer that an accommodation is necessary at any point during their employment. If an employer has 15 or more employees, they must provide reasonable accommodations to those with disabilities to help them perform the essential duties of their position. ADA.gov is a wonderful resource on the Americans with Disabilities Act and reasonable accommodations. So what is a reasonable accommodation? A reasonable accommodation is a workplace accommodation, any modification or adjustment to a job or work environment that enables a person with a disability to do his or her job. Some of these may include moving a workspace closer to the bathroom, adjusting schedules to be more flexible with healthcare appointments, or even working from home when you aren't feeling well. A reasonable request does not impose excessive difficulty on your employer and is something that can be fairly easily adopted. An unreasonable request might be very costly for the employer, might ask for big changes to the way the business operates, or is simply a preference and not a necessity due to the disability. A few tips on how to request a workplace accommodation. The first is to be sure to request your accommodation in advance. You can request it either verbally or in writing, although I would recommend putting your request in writing and having copies of what was submitted just for tracking purposes. You can speak with your human resources department if you have questions about the process. The second tip is to make sure you have the appropriate documentation. Get your paperwork together, including a doctor's note or any medical evidence to support your request and have that ready to submit. And lastly, understand that your employer may have questions. Under the ADA, your employer does have the right to ask for medical information related to your accommodation, but they cannot ask for any medical info outside of that initial accommodation request. After the accommodation is implemented, the employer and the employee should continue to communicate to ensure that the accommodation is working, and if not, to make adjustments. We have another patient story, and her name is Allie. Allie is a Crohn's disease patient and is an attorney at a nonprofit organization. When she first took her job, she was honest about her need to have infusions every six weeks to manage her condition. Her workplace was understanding and allowed her to come in to work later on the days that she had infusions. Thankfully, she's in remission and doesn't feel the need to share that she may need to go to the bathroom more frequently or request any additional time off. In talking about workplace accommodations, we cannot avoid talking about accommodations and requests in light of the pandemic we're facing. Let's go into some of the things to keep in mind. Having IBD does not increase your risk of becoming infected with COVID-19. However, according to the Centers of Disease Control, or the CDC, people who take certain immunosuppressive medications might be at higher risk for experiencing a more severe disease if they do get the virus. Severe COVID-19 among patients with IBD is associated with increased age, comorbidities, or having two or more medical conditions, as well as corticosteroid use. In response to the pandemic, the federal government enacted the Families First Coronavirus Response Act that provides many employees with paid leave to cover COVID-19 related illness and childcare needs. This paid leave benefit applies to employees who work for employers covered under this act who meet any of the following criteria. If you're quarantined or isolated because of federal, state, or local guidelines or guidance from a healthcare provider, or if you have one or more COVID-19 symptoms and are awaiting diagnosis, or if you're caring for someone who meets those criteria. The paid sick leave under the Family First Coronavirus Response Act covers up to 80 hours of paid leave for COVID-19 related illness or quarantine 
and up to 80 hours paid leave if you're acting as a caregiver for someone with COVID-19 related illness or quarantine. Also, the Act expands FMLA to provide 12 weeks of job protected leave if childcare or schools are closed. And there's some valuable information available about COVID-19 relief and assistance on the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation website. Let's go through some commonly asked questions regarding IBD patients, the ADA, and returning to work during this pandemic. Can a patient with IBD at risk for COVID-19 request a workplace accommodation? Yes, you can inform your employer that you need an accommodation for a reason related to a medical condition for example, taking steroids increases the risk of worse outcomes if COVID-19 is contracted. While the employee or third party does not need to use the term reasonable accommodation or reference the ADA at all, you can certainly do that. What are some reasonable work accommodations for patients with IBD at risk of COVID-19? The Job Accommodation Network, or JAN, which is a division of the U.S. Department of Labor, has suggested that employees with an underlying condition who take immune suppressing medications might be eligible to seek accommodations under the ADA to reduce their contact with the public. And these accommodations might include wearing a mask, installing a glass shield, increasing options to work from home, or a combination of the above strategies depending on how your job is structured and the specifics of your job. Is an employee entitled to an accommodation under the ADA in order to avoid exposing a family member at higher risk of severe illness from COVID-19 due to an underlying medical condition? No. The ADA bans discrimination based on having a disability. However, it doesn't require that the employer accommodate employees without a disability based on any needs that their family member may have related to disability. For more information about returning to work and all resources pertaining to COVID-19 and IBD, you can visit Crohn'sColitisFoundation.org slash coronavirus for great information like IBD patient guidance, relief and assistance programs, and vaccine guidance. A few things I wanted to make sure you took away from today's presentation. The first is FMLA is a federal law which allows workers with a serious health condition to take up to 12 weeks of leave from work without the threat of losing their job. It's important for you to research and understand short and long-term disability benefits that you have available to you in the event you need to utilize them. And lastly, reasonable workplace accommodations can be requested under the ADA and will apply if you're concerned about your risk during the COVID-19 pandemic. And some patients with IBD wanted to share helpful advice about how to navigate an IBD diagnosis in the workplace. Work and lifestyle balance is important. It's okay to make a change. For instance, making the switch from traditional companies to freelancing to accommodate your needs can be done or one patient with an environmental background left a physically demanding job in their field to author science books at home. So don't be afraid to kind of reevaluate what works for you and make a change if you need to. Also share. Although you don't legally need to disclose your medical condition, some patients have found that sharing their diagnosis with others has been able to help foster and help them understand more. And that includes your coworkers, and your employer. They might be more flexible if they know more about your condition. If you need more support, you're welcome to contact Patient Advocate Foundation and an expert there will assist you one-on-one -on -one with questions about workplace rights and benefits. If you're looking for more information surrounding your diagnosis of IBD, managing your diagnosis financially, or tips and resources for employees, 
the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation is a great resource. In addition to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation website being a wonderful resource, they also have trained specialists available to provide more specific information. They can also provide guidance and support, give referrals to local support and education group, and have free brochures and fact sheets they can provide you and support you in 170 different languages. You can reach the IBD Help Center Monday through Friday from 9 to 5 Eastern at 888-MY-GUT-PAIN at info at Foundation.org or through live chat at Foundation.org. Thank you again for joining today, and we hope the information presented was valuable. Have a great day.